It's a joy again to share with you God's precious word. If ever there is something we all long for, I guess it is this one, that there might be easy going in life, that there might be peace and serenity, that there might not be any setbacks and challenges and frustration and pain and hurts. And as long as we, as much as we long for the nice things, we often are confronted for those things that we would regard as not so nice. Those things that shake us to the bone, those things that keep us sleepless, those things that keep us tired and frustrated and angry and anxious. Unfortunately, life dishes out, and what it dishes out is a large dose of things that I would like to call challenges. And oftentimes we sit back and we look at it, and most people tend to just give up hope because it's just a little bit beyond them. It's too much to ask. It's too much to do. It's too much to look for. And so we find a large segment of our society who give up before they even start. We hear of senseless killings, we hear of these suicides simply because people can't cope anymore. They'd want to jump off because of the challenges. And how often we ourselves personally have sat there and looked at these challenges. Some of us have put our hands on our heads and said, I give up. I can't make it. It's not, it's not in me. I don't think I have the ability to cope. I just, it is just a little bit too hard. And so we call it a day. Just sitting, giving up the fight. Is anything too hard for us? Of course. Nearly everything is a bit too hard for us. It becomes a challenge. A driver might find it hard to negotiate a bend, and there he crushes the car, and we have a mangled wreck, maybe we have a dead body. An engineer might find it hard to metal stitch a block. A architect may find it hard to put a design on print. A cardiologist may find it hard to mend that heart. A weatherman might find it hard to predict the weather. A surgeon may find it hard to diagnose the case. In life, hardships is what we inherit. And hardships is what we have to face and deal with. Hardships all of the time. And while we look at these hardships, and while we struggle with these hardships, and while we give up on these hardships, we become aware of an almighty God who stands and asks a very important question in Genesis 18:14. And the question he asks is this one: Is anything is anything to add for God? And as we look at ourselves and we look at the impossibilities in so many areas, we look at ourselves and we look at the mountain and we say it's too hard to climb. We look at the sea and we say it's too hard to swim across. And, and, and we look at the tree and we say it's too hard to climb the tree. You know, there's so many things that we struggle with in our personal life beside the, the struggles that are dished out for us to deal with daily. We look at ourselves and we say it's hard. But then we look at God and God reminds us who He is and what we need to do. 
we sometimes fail miserably in doing the most important task in all of our lives. The most important task is not deal with the task. The most important task is to point Jesus to the task, is to take Jesus to the task, is to take God in and have him help us see it through. Is anything too hard for God? Why did God make that statement? Well, there was a couple that were struggling. A man that was 75 and God told him he'll get a son through his wife, Sarah. And the guy reached 100 and he's still waiting. 100 years. Where is this that God has promised? And his wife, in her 90, she laughed when she was reminded again that she was going to give birth and have a baby. At 90, she literally laughed and in response to that, God says, come on now, is anything too hard for me? And as we sit here and look at our problems and our struggles and our storms and our headaches and, and our challenges, and they seem so awesome, they seem so big, they seem so difficult, we all struggle with those things. And God is once again asking us the most important question in all of life. Is anything too hard for God? You see, when we are confronted with that question, we need to have an answer. And, and what is our answer today? Our answer is not a ready yes. Our answer should be, gathering all of our problems, bundling it up, and casting it on Jesus, taking it to Jesus, with the understanding that he has the ability to deal with them, no matter how hard it might seem. You could get the best of the surgeons with years of experience, no one can create a baby, cause a baby to be born at that age. At that age when the organs have given up and have become weakened. At that age when it is simply impossible to have a turn around. God can breathe a breath of fresh air. And God can cause weak organs Collapsing organs, failing organs, tired, fatigued organs to come alive and come fresh and become ready to carry a baby through full term. And that is what God is pointing us to today. God is saying that he can take dead situations and that what we look at, look at is sometimes dead situations. We openly say it can never turn around. It will never happen. It is finished. I'm finished. And so often we make that predicament. But God is saying today, with man it's impossible. But, Matthew, 11, Matthew 19, 26, but with God, but with God all things are possible. With you alone, never. With you alone, impossible. With you alone, it'll never happen. But you bring God in. But with God, with God, with God, all things are possible. He is the important factor. He is the activating factor. He is the igniting part of this happening. And God is saying that he will... And he wants to kindle a flame. And he wants to make all things possible for those that believe. 
I know we all make decisions from time to time and we weigh our problems and we go through it many times like with a fine tooth comb analyzing it dissecting it looking at it from every angle and then we make a decision and we say look I don't think there's going to be a turnaround. It's impossible for me. And then we settle as we push it in one hand and we say, well, it's never going to happen. But I want you to today bring in the igniting factor, bring in God and let God deal with it. And the Bible says, God says, if he, he is called in, he will make the impossible possible. The impossible possible. He is still the architect of this entire creation, the designer. He is the source of life, the life giver. He is the living waters. He is the bread of life. He is the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He is our healer. He is our deliverer. He is our sustainer. He is everything we'll ever need. Is anything too hard for God? And as we look at ourselves and our capacity in doing things, oftentimes we walk away from certain areas because it's just a bit too off. It's too hard, too difficult, it can't be done. We walk away. But bring God in, no matter what that situation, bring God in. Bring God in. We are told that Jesus comes to Jerusalem. He comes on a special occasion. It was a time of celebration, it was a time of meeting and greeting, it was a time of gelling with some of the high-level people in the synagogue. And Jesus' place was to go to the synagogue for that very important celebration. And while he makes his way there, John 5 verse 1 to 8 tells us the story that Jesus decides to step out of his routine. There was near that place a sheep market, and, in that sh and, and there at that sheep market was a pool, which had five pouches, and it was called Bethsaida, meaning house of mercy. It was an appropriate name for that place. It was like a clinic or a hospital. And those, the hopeless cases, those that were blind and deaf and, and couldn't walk and withered and, and all kind of ailments were brought and placed at that hospital or at that pool for a very special reason. And the reason was this, that that pool was not just an ordinary pool. It was a pool of hope. It was a pool of healing. Every now and then, an angel will come and step into the water and will do some staring. And anyone that's, that's there, irrespective of who they are, irrespective of what disease they had, if they were able to step in to that water, they would be healed instantly. And so you had people coming, family members coming, bringing their loved one that was sick and unmanageable anymore at home. It was like a hospice. They came and placed them there. And can you imagine the pool with that bright water. And on the hedge were people all crowded on the hedge of the pool. 
as close to the water as possible, waiting, waiting for some stirring so that they can quickly, the, the thing was they needed to quickly go into the water. And those that went in first were healed. Here was a man who for many, okay, on many occasions sat on the hedge of that pool, slept there on his bed. And as time went on, he was pushed further and further away. But he still had that same mentality as when he first went in. He was told, look down. You need to look down. You need to look down at the water. You need to look down at the staring. That is where your hope lies. You need to look down. And this man did that for 38 years. Picture this if you can. All these withered people all over that place full. And then Jesus comes and he walks among them. I wonder why Jesus didn't. <laughs> but the thing is, he didn't. He could have stretched out his hand and, and said, Hall, be healed. And every one of them would have got healed. Like when he was at the tomb of Lazarus, he could have said, stretched out his hands and said, All arise from the dead and all would have rose. But Jesus was specific then in the case of Lazarus as he was specific in this case. In the case of Lazarus, he said, Lazarus, get up. And dead, four day dead Lazarus jumped out of that grave. And yeah, was this man looking down at the water. That's all he did, was look down with the hope that he will catch the stirring. With the hope that this will be his day. With the hope that he could somehow, he couldn't use his legs anymore, but somehow you can just roll over the hedge and touch the water first. 38 years, he was counting the years. 38 years, 38 years, 38 years, 38 years. I'm thinking of us here today. I'm thinking of the number of years we look at our calamity, we look at our pressure, we look at our pain, we look at our storm, we look at our struggle, we look at our frustration. 38 years for this man. He perhaps reached a stage where he thought, well, all hope was gone. As some of us sit here and we count the number of years we are in our predicament, we count the number of years that we've in our struggle. We count the number of years we've been praying. We count the number of years we've been standing in queues for prayer. We count the number of years we look to others to pray for us so that we could be healed. And nothing has happened. And we're now sitting here with our struggle, convinced that we have to live with it. And nothing is going to happen. We reach a stage where we look down upon ourselves because we see something is not correct. We look down upon ourselves because we know that we shouldn't be there. We look down at ourselves and we look at this impediment that we have that seems to have galvanized and pulled us down and kept us from moving forward. 
We look at those schoolmates that we've schooled with. We look at our neighbor boys. We look at them getting places, the neighbor girls. We look at them getting places. We look at them getting fine jobs. You see them driving fine cars. You see them getting married, having a fine family. We see them moving on into fine homes. But we look at ourselves and we look down upon ourselves while others point fingers and look down upon us. It's all about looking down and being down and feeling down and knowing there's no way we can ever climb up. I'm wondering if you ever felt like that or you're feeling like that right now. I think all of us in all of our lives we reach a point where we just feel down and low because of some things we have personally done or because of some things that we were pushed into doing by others and we just like sheep followed and here we caught in a trap feeling down you see I want you to know today that there is a mastermind who knows everything and he knows how you're thinking at this time and if you want to have a turn around, then he's willing to step in your direction and he's willing to say the correct things to you that will cause a quickening. This man slept there on his bed for 38 years. And whenever which was probably rare. Whenever a family member decided to bring him a meal or decided to visit him, I think the first question they would ask is this. Are you looking down? You sure you're looking down? You better look down. That's the way it is. Look at the water. Look down. And so there was no hope really for him to look up to anything, to look up for some change, to look up to somebody because he was doctrinized and he was controlled by those things and he obediently obeyed. And so when a gentleman comes to his side and asks him, do you want to be healed? Is there something I can do for you? Do you want to be healed? You know what his thinking was? What statement he made? He says, nobody. Nobody took me down there. Nobody helped me to get down there. Nobody pushed me down there. Nobody gave me a chance to get down there. His thinking and his feeling was still to get down. But Jesus came with another message totally different. Jesus said, get up. I'm not talking about you getting down and staying down and being down and thinking down. I want you to get up. Your hope lies up. Your hope lies out of this environment. Your hope lies in getting out of this place. As long as you're in this place, you're going to be confronted by the thinkings of this place. You need to get up and you need to move out. And Jesus told the man, take up your bed and walk. And the man heard the message and did the bedding. He got up. You see, all the time he was sleeping there, he was one step from healing. 
He was one step from a better life. He was one step from a better, uh, from a brighter life. He was just one step away. And he needed that word. Take up your bed and walk. Take up your bed and walk. And I think some of us need to listen today very carefully. Because your hope lies in you getting up. Your hope lies in you listening to that voice and looking up. Your hope lies above something that is beyond you. That's where your hope lies. And I trust that we will look to Jesus as a source of all of our supply. As we look at ourselves, we are aware what we're going through. And we often tell it so boldly, but you don't know. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know my pain. You don't know my struggle. You don't know my turmoil. You don't know. And it's true. We'll never know. But he knows. God knows. Jesus knows. He knows what to do. Why? Because he's made you for who you are. He made you. And the Bible says this, that God is willing to take us by the hand and as, is willing to lead us into a better life. We need to look to him. It is a long message, but I cut it short. We find in Mark 10, 46, a blind man. He stood there, very sensitive to the surroundings. Could see nothing, absolutely nothing. But he could hear everything. He heard the sounds, he heard the shuffling, he heard the walking feet. And he was specially trained to understand that situation. And he knew there was a lot of people that were moving on in that area where he was. And then he asked the question, tell me, what is happening? He asked somebody who had the answer for him. And they told him, Jesus was around. Who's this Jesus? You don't know? Well, Jesus is the healer. Well, Jesus is the peace giver. Well, Jesus, well, Jesus, oh, he's some, got some fantastic words, you know. That Jesus, the great preacher. And what did the blind man do? He did something that I believe we all should do. Today and forever. Because all of us in our own little way, we are also blind. We cannot see that we should really see. We may have eyes, good high sights. But there are other eyes that need to be opened. There, are, there is the eyes of our understanding the Bible talks about that needs to be opened. There needs to be the eyes of our hearts that need to be opened that will that'll be able to comprehend big things. Comprehend the big things. And those big things can only be opened or become aware, become evident when our eyes of our understanding and the eyes of our hearts are opened. This blind man cried out. He said this in his mind. Last chance. It never happened. I stood here for years under this sycamore tree. Nothing happened. No Jesus came, came my way before. Maybe there will be no Jesus coming my way again. This is my last chance. 
And he did something, like I said, we all need to do. He cried out. That's what he did. He said, Jesus, Jesus, the son of David, Jesus. And what, whatever Jesus was doing, Jesus stopped. You see, that cry was a Jesus-stopping cry. And sometimes we need to make that Jesus stop and cry. And Jesus stopped in his feet or wherever he was. And he says, call that guy, bring that guy. And people ran and they brought this blind Bartimaeus to Jesus. Long story short, Jesus touched him and he was healed. Why? Why was he healed? Because he was desperate. He was tired of living in a dark world. He was tired of begging. And one of the first things he did while he was going to Jesus was he took off his coat and he threw it on the ground. That coat identified his trade. That coat meant that he was a beggar. Immediately while he was walking to Jesus, he took out that garment and he threw it. In other words, in his mind, he says, when I go to Jesus, I'm no more going to be a beggar. When I'm going to go to Jesus, I'm no more going to be blind. When I'm going to go to Jesus, I just going to be a turn around. When I go to Jesus, there's going to be a shifting in my circumstances. When I go to Jesus, I'm going to have a new life. I'm going to have a new life. And when he did go to Jesus, all his aspirations were fulfilled. Some of us today are casual we casual in our dressing, and that's great. We become casual in our thinking, not so great. And we came casual in our activities. But when we start shifting it into something more precise and something more profound, the change will come. Don't just say, Lord, Thank you, good God, isn't it? I love you too much. Just bless me and my family. Nothing's going to happen with your casualness. Come before God. God, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of this drug infection of God. I'm tired of being a addict. I'm tired of God that this is plaguing me year after year. I'm keep relapsing. God, I'm tired. Hear me, God, I'm tired. I want a shifting. Shift me. And when God wants to do shifting, many don't want to be shifted. And because you don't want to be shifted, no shifting ever gets done. The man came to, Jesus came to the man, said, take up your bed. And walk. Take up your bed and walk. And the man took his bed. He wanted to follow Jesus. He says, No, don't follow me. Talk about what is being done. And he went as a testimony. God is looking for testimonies today. God is looking for changing, changed lives today. God is looking to change, shift you so that he can put a testimony in your mouth. Have the testimony in your mouth. Start talking about God. Start talking about his goodness. And when you please God, God will be pleased to please you. Shall we stand to our feet this morning? Praise his name. We praise his name. We thank you, our Heavenly Father. We look at our lives that are full of hardships, O oh God. A lives, O oh God, that seem to be entangled with so much of pain and so many closed doors. But we thank you, Lord, in that you said you're able to open up. You're able to refresh. 
You're able, Lord, to do great things for your children. Nothing is impossible for you. All of us have our unique situations, oh God. And no matter what it is, you have the recipe for every one of them. Help us, Lord, to be strengthened in our inner man. Help us, Lord, so that we can become strong. Help us, Lord, so that we can take up our bed and walk as a testimony for the goodness of God. Bless us today, Lord, with a special enriching portion of God that will do the quickening. And may we go out of here knowing that we have a friend, we have a God, that our Lord is one who is supreme and there's nothing too hard for him. And if there's nothing too hard for God, there's nothing too hard for us because God will fight all of our battles and the victory will be ours. Father, we thank you today even as we take leave. May we go home with the knowledge that we have a great God who is great in all his greatness and your greatness, Lord, will never subside, will never come low. Help us, Lord, to understand that and nurture that and accept that and to promote that and to use that, Lord, for our betterment. Go with us, Lord, for this we ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, for Jesus' sake, and everybody say, Amen. God bless you, church.